So, I've called this the Changing Landscape of um, NHS Education and Workforce, which again, I've changed the title very slightly because I think, just by way of introduction, there has never been a time in health and social care where we are seeing so much change in education, workforce, role development, and the landscape and agenda that that's trying to meet as we are at the moment. Um, as Sarah said, I did a session um, last, possibly last week, uh, for the, the faculty timeout, where I concentrated quite a lot on what's going on in the accountable care system and what the changes are in HEE, very much at that sort of higher level strategic context. I haven't done as much of that in here today because I really wanted to focus more on some of the education reforms and what's going on there in the role development. But I'm more than happy to answer questions about that because I just really wanted to very much give that over to you. I'm very happy to sort of do that. So, uh, next one, please. But just in terms of context, um, as you know, probably the first thing that signalled this significant change that we've got in the landscape was this, which was moving very much from 2016 to NHS-funded course fee, NHS-funded bursaries, course fees, which actually meant that on the left-hand side, the vast majority of pre-registration students could come out of their pre-registration training debt-free. Not everybody, not entirely, but give or take, pretty well debt free. And as we all know, there was the comprehensive spending review uh, in the autumn of that year that said actually we're going to move the entire of all of those programmes to self-funding. Uh, and the thinking behind that, which I have to say, and I can say any of this right because I'm not holding to anybody in terms of what I can say and what I can't say unless I break the law, um, but actually, the thinking behind this was that there was a view that the universities were constrained by the number of students they could take because of the education commissioning process, because obviously every one of those students received funding from the government to actually train. And there was a view that the commissioning was putting a ceiling on the numbers, and that actually if you left it out to the marketplace and let all the students go self-funding, then actually it would allow universities to recruit as many people as they wanted and bingo, we'd sort the workforce issue out because by the time this happened, of course, we were starting to see severe workforce shortages, particularly in nursing. So that moved us into 2017 where, in fact, as you now know, students now access the standard student support package. So the vast majority are going to be coming out with a debt of somewhere around about £57,000. The, as I said, the idea was that we create an additional 10,000 nursing and health professional training places over five years to do that. Already, as we're going into 2018, we've started to see what we probably already predicted by that, which is the first that actually the numbers applying for all professional programmes is going down, not up. There are still some that are managing perfectly well, midwifery being a really good case in point. We're not really seeing much of a change in midwifery. Um, but equally, um, We've, we're, so we're not only seeing, um, see, seeing the, those numbers going, go, going down rather than up. Um, so, so it's clearly not, but also, as you know, one of the biggest constraints for pre-registration isn't the numbers of students who can come onto a university programme, it's the placements. It's all about the placements. Now, I'm a nurse by background, and as all of you know, we're here from nursing backgrounds, uh, pre-registration curriculum, um, the NMC requirements, is 50% practice. So you can't get around that. Now, there's some moves to start looking at that to say, can we count simulation a bit more? There are, there are things that are in train. But primarily, um, most, most places are pretty well up to the wire in terms of placements anyway. Midwifery has always got the issue, which is it cannot really go on its, its uh, top of its ceiling because of the very you know, significant supervision arrangements that go with that and all the rest of it. So I think some of us feel that this was entirely fatal flawed in the beginning anyway, and of course is now beginning to, um, to work through. The thing I would say as well, that is a significant feature of this, <clears throat> and I talk a lot about this, and I'll pick it up as we're going through this. This here actually created a relationship between the student and the NHS. So essentially, if you like, this translated, which was 
We'll pay for you to train as a healthcare professional. We'll ensure that obviously you've got a job to go to in your work in the workforce. Um, you know, we'll put you on a fairly sort of stable salary and your pension, you know, and pretty good pension as well. So even though the NHS is not going to give you uh, rewards and riches beyond your wildest dreams or anything like that, that's not usually why most people are going into it in the first place, but if you like, there was a tacit relationship there. We'll invest in you, you come and work for us. That's all blown away. There's no, we, we, the, no student going through this program is actually beholden to the NHS for anything. In fact, if anything, you know, they're only beholden to the student loan company. So, how we're going to start working differently with this workforce is a very, very different one, because the other thing that this is already starting to do is to show us that actually, for some, actually the NHS may not be the destination that they want to go to when they qualify anyway. Are you getting more matures? Are you losing matures? Yes. And that's the other thing to say about this, that it's just come out actually in some discussion over the last week. You, you probably won't have um, followed this, but actually it's, it's quite important to know the health, the health Select Committee sat yesterday and its list of things to consider this time ran to around about eight pages. One of the things on there is that part of this ignored the postgraduate pre-registration workforce which is a fast track program for existing graduates who can do a two year accelerated program both here and at the University of Sheffield for which the bursary was still, was still attached to that. And that program is particularly attractive to mature students. That's got a question mark over it because only because the only reason that's carried on being funded is that they didn't realise it was even running, they'd forgotten about it. <laughs> it wasn't a design, it was just, you know, it just got missed in the comprehensive spending review. So now there's a question mark over that because they can't work out whether to fund it or not. It's having a massive impact, of course, on recruitment onto those programmes. So absolutely one of the first things that was, in fact, when all of the consultation was done on this, the biggest thing that was actually put forward is the way this disadvantages mature students. Yes. Are there monitoring some the statistics around sort of the ME or people that come from deprived communities? Because we've always had an issue with that in terms of higher education. Mm -hmm. And this for me makes it even more difficult to strive towards if it you does. started out from different sort of because that's does. something they're gonna be watching. I very, very much doubt it. So as I'll come on to talk about the fact of course is that there's a number of things that have now had to move into the space that's being vacated by this. So I'll come on to talk about that which might sort of address some of your question. So next slide please. So this is of course all in relation to the fact that workforce is now an endangered species. And this has happened relatively quickly. This has happened in four or five years. The perfect storm was brewing, we said it was coming, we knew it was coming, it's here. And now, of course, we've got lots of you know people standing jumping up and down and saying, oh, what are we going to do, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? Uh, but it is now the number one risk to services. So when you're looking at anything around service redesign, transformation of services, New developments, da 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 da. The main reason none of those are actually going to take place in the way that people want them to at the moment is you have a lot of workforce to actually um, develop those. So every single organisation is struggling. So it's now the biggest risk, it's on every NHS Trust's board agenda in terms of the risk. Uh, as I say, there are services that, um, in fact, having just come from the ACS thing, Today, we have got whole services within South Yorkshire that will collapse within, within 12 months if there isn't a plan for either somebody to take them over, merge them, do something. It's not because the service isn't required, it's because there just isn't the staffing to run it. So it's the number one risk. Uh, these are some of the figures from, there's a new workforce strategy for uh, the NHS which is eye-watering. It's actually not a bad strategy, actually, but it's eye-watering in terms of the statistics in there. Um, and, of course, it has to obviously put in there, so because it's the Department of Health report, it has to put some of the good news in there as well. So, there are 40,000 more NHS clinicians than 2012. There are 40,000 clinical vacancies, um, however, um, and that 92% of those are being covered by bank and agency. Um, and this is very much looking to the future. Without change, the NHS is going to need 190,000 new staff by 2027. That's in the National Workforce Strategy. That's assuming affordability, which clearly 
is a big issue there. And here in, well, in South Yorkshire, we have weathered the workforce shortages much better than other parts of the country, but it's still having a major impact on our services. Why have we weathered it? Any ideas why we've weathered it better than other bits of the country, do you think? A lot of our students stay yeah. in Sheffield. They do. It's cheaper than South. Yeah, absolutely. So it's for all, it's, it's for lots of those different reasons. So it's absolutely the fact that um, students like coming to Sheffield, um, and uh, and once they've come to the universities in Sheffield, they like Sheffield as a city. It's a good student city. And what's more, when you get to, so actually, if you're looking for a clinical career, everything's on your doorstep. You don't have to go very far to find the specialty that you want to work in. Uh, house prices are affordable. Um, peak districts on the doorstep, uh, as well as, you know, actually it's got a lot going for it. And the other thing I would say, and I will say this because it's sort of part of my legacy of leaving STH, as a, as a region we have walked, we work really, really well as a partnership between colleges, universities and providers. And we've endured those relationships, we've worked through issues, we've worked through problems. Uh, it's been absolutely the cornerstone of my work in Sheffield, which is to make sure that the universities um, continue to work really closely with us on making sure that we've got the student population right. In other words, the students that you're, you know, the university are taking on as students are the workforce that we want to employ. Lots of things that are done in partnership with each other, and that's been really enduring as well. So it's a really good combination of those factors. And it actually applies to our support workers as well. Most of our support workers come through our local colleges and sometimes they're on career pathways um, with us once they come to work with us. They come through apprenticeship schemes. Uh, we employ most of our support workers from the local population. Uh, and that's not just true of Sheffield. I actually live in Doncaster. Um, and actually, you know, um, my mother lives very close by me now and spent a, a bit of time in, Donc in the DRI over the summer, I was really struck by particularly the, um, the support workers, quite clearly a very, very local workforce. That makes a big difference actually to the, the patients as well because they're looked after by people they can relate to. They're looked after people, you know, by people like them and that really makes a big difference. And it's one of the things that's really important to recognise. Hospitals, of course, should reflect the population uh, that they actually serve, and, uh, and it, it, it's something that's really important. So South Yorkshire has weathered the storm significantly. If you contrast that with Cambridge, and we've done some work with Cambridge recently, um, even for newly qualified, they might be better off going and working in Aldo. The cost of housing in Cambridge is shocking, transport costs are shocking, even if they manage to get their students through to qualification, very few stay there because they simply can't afford to live there. And that's the same, obviously, for London as well. Yeah, somebody had a question. Me? Um, so the contrast is great. And so this picture, the NHS, you know, the national picture, of course, is particularly concentrated in the South. Where it completely turns on its head is general practice where the south of England is stuffed full of GPs working out of nice leafy green um, and having a very nice time, thank you. The north, particularly, you can literally draw a line across the middle of the country. Once you get past, we're well, probably about what for gap, um, GPs become more and more sparse, then take that out towards the coastal areas and they're virtually non-existent. Um, and nothing nationally has done anything to incentivise GPs to come north. So unless they happen to have trained in the north or come from the north or got family in the north, most of them, of course, are, are not gravitating towards the north. So we've got a six, so we've got so actually where this turns on its head is we have got a significant problem um, in relation to that. So workforce absolutely is our most endangered species at the moment. Thank you. So the landscape. So what's moving in then? What's moving into this landscape to try and actually overcome some of this? Well, coincidentally, and believe me, this wasn't planned, is the introduction of the apprenticeship levy. And I'll come on to talk a little bit more about that later on, but the levy actually has been applied to every large employer across the country, including the public sector. Slightly mad, because we have to pay into the levy now um, to get a training grant back. So we're paying in to a levy to the government with taxpayers' money, which just 
is barking, really, isn't it? Um, whereas, of course, you know, the idea was, of course, is, and, and of course, it was designed by a very different department of health. It was, it, it was invented by Biz, um, who actually don't, no longer even exist. Um, so we've got the levy. So that came along at the same time as the comprehensive spending review. So that's really sort of put a little bit of grit in the uh, grit in the in the machinery, really. Can I just ask? Sorry, I'm not familiar with this terminology. When you say so, as organisations, you pay money yeah. so that you yeah. can have prices come to you. Is that no, no, no. This is just. So the apprenticeship levy was a, is, is designed by government, which is that every large employer that I think has a turnover of more than three million pounds, so that doesn't, you don't need very many people to, to have a turnover of that, or I think has a certain number of workforce, I, I'll, I'm, um, I'd have to go back and look at it, has to pay a levy into the apprenticeship levy. It has to pay a levy, essentially, uh, from, the, you know, from its um, central resources into a levy pot, which is held by government. Okay, um, and, and it's based on the number of employees you get. So for Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, for example, 16,500 staff, our contribution to the levy is just under £3 million. Annually. Annually. So if you're a smaller organisation, obviously it's according. So some organisations are paying something like 250000 But it's not an insignificant amount of money. What that then means is that that's then transferred, that's then turned into a digital account. So for every apprenticeship you employ, every apprentice you employ, you can pull on the digital account for the course fees for that apprentice. Okay? So the intention is to increase the number of apprenticeships. But as I'll come on to say, it's not working terribly well either. So what that means is that so for every one of our support workers, for example, who is going through an apprenticeship, their course fees are paid for by the levy. But actually, of course, the, the, the amount we're getting back at is nowhere near what we're paying in. I wondered why I just um, start funding support, support workers for the rest of the nursing course. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm wondering why they were doing it. It's, 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 <coughs> it's not covering access to nursing. It's not covering access to nursing. Oh, that's probably more than a huge sum of stuff that he's been trying to get into electric engineering for years and years, couldn't get a placement. And the companies that took him on had to pay into that. That's right, so they're getting it back. And that's where it's seen as the incentive. If you've got to pay into it, you might still try and get it back by doing that. It's not, it's the... He's working for the son who's got his own business, but yeah. it's his father in law that pays the levy. Yeah, so you can, there, there are, yeah. and, there, there, and, and now the rules around this run to pages in terms of what you can give, what you can't, what's a provider status. Uh, there are very strict release times, so one of the things that's actually against it is the fact that apprenticeships have got quite significant release that goes with that. That actually in healthcare gives us a bit of an issue because it actually means apprenticeships get far better release than our qualified staff do. Uh, for their CPD because actually we're bound by apprenticeship rules and we're not bound by anything else. So the introduction of the levy of course has significantly changed the landscape because what it's also done is provided this sudden explosion of apprenticeships that we didn't even have last year and I'll talk about those in a moment as well. Major restructure and change of focus at Health Education England. We used to have, which is where I'm going, we used to have lots of little regions. We had 13 regions, Yorkshire and the Humber, which from our point of view was all running along very nicely. But of course, the comprehensive spending review, wiping out the bursary and commissioning, meant to put not too fine a point in it, HEE hadn't really got a job to do. It still got the, the, what was the deanery, but essentially a huge part of its work was commissioning pre-registrations, not doing that anymore. So it's reinvented itself, it's now got actually just four regions, north, south, east and west, and it's very much working on workforce transformation. It's looking at a very different model about how it's supporting new workforce going forward, and in particular because it coincides with the creation of the STPs, or accountable care systems, uh, which are also coming on stream right now. So because of that, HEE is now thinking, okay, we need to attach ourselves to those accountable care systems because that's how we're, we're going to do that. So I'll just check. I don't know if I've got a slide on accountable care systems before I start going on about them. Um, but 
but uh, they're, they're very much the, um, the the way in which we're probably going to be able to we're going to be organising things later um, going forward. No, I haven't. So the um, so as I said, I wasn't going to spend too much time on this because it's sort of slightly outward. But essentially, out of the five year forward view, um, part of the uh, recommendations in there is that actually we create, everywhere was asked to um, get itself into, I think it was 44, they wanted 44 sustainability and transformation plans from geographical regions that basically says, the footprint is, we can't carry on as we are. Never mind just about the workforce, the way in which we've got services developed at the moment and where services are sitting, A, it's not affordable, and secondly, it's not going to meet the population needs going forward. So actually, as you know, we've got a split between health and social care, which creates all sorts of problems. So the main driver of the five-year forward foot view was actually the demographics of the country, that actually the way in which we've got commissioning set up, that we've got providers all, all not joined up together, is actually, particularly for our older population, isn't working at all. And secondly, we're still very much wedded to a hospital-based model, because we always have been, because that's how the NHS likes to organise itself. And given the fact that actually where we should be putting our energy is a lot more on prevention, community-based practice, and all of that, we need to change that model around. What's the answer? You make these organisations start working together with a plan about how they're going to meet the population needs going forward. There are, so that was 2016. Accountable care systems are coming along because there's already two vanguards and the biggest vanguard nearest to us is Greater Manchester. You probably know that Greater Manchester is known as a completely devolved or it's a, it's a completely devolved system now. In other words, they've got entire accountability for the whole of Greater Manchester. They're virtually self-governing. So that's local authority and health all in together with their own board pretty well getting on with it. So one budget, one budget going in there and they sort it all out. So everybody's been watching Manchester to see how it works through. The other's actually in the Surrey Heartlands, which I know very little about. But the second wave is eight, um, or I think it's 10 STPs whose plans were considered good enough to make them accountable care systems and South Yorkshire is one of them. So where I've just come from this morning is because this goes live on the 1st of April. So we're very much at the point now where about actually there's some money that comes in, we're very much looking at, and I'm part of that because actually my role in HEE is very much about shaping the whole workforce hub that goes with that. Is that going to be sort of a mirroring of what's happening in Greater Manchester when you talked about the local authority yeah. and health coming together with one pot of money, but is this what you're... The pot of money, not yet, the pot of money isn't going to happen quite yet, but it will be there, and it's very much an iterative process. I think the thing to be really clear about, the accountable care system is not a statutory body. It's a coming together of organisations who, if you like, have a commitment to work together to improve the health of the population. But to do that, there is now a review of hospital services about where certain services should be, and obviously what's playing into that is particularly the workforce issues. So, for example, some of the reviews around maternity at the moment aren't just about where those services should be, it's also about can we actually keep going the way in which we have been up until now. So for example, Bassett Law, maternity services have to close quite frequently because they just haven't got any staff. And that's at every level. So there's some work streams that are working through that. So, what, so the things that actually our system's committed to is to review cancer services, emergency care, mental health, pathology and imaging services uh, and hyperacute stroke. So there's a number of disciplines that are also working through that as well, which is to say actually for the health of our population, those probably need to be organised differently with some strict, you know, streams that go through that. Um, so there's a, you know, it's very early days and interestingly this morning, it was Chris Hamm from the King's Fund that was facilitating this session and what's interesting is none of the models look the same. So what Manchester looks like will not be what South Yorkshire looks like, which will not be what um, uh, one of the London ones look like. We've all got to do our own thing. So of course they're coming along at the same time um, to do that. So actually it has quite a big implication for how we develop workforce. 
because there is a possibility now that we can develop workforce that says actually in some roles we, we need people who will work across a lot more and it's all about the patient's pathway and making sure that patients get the right outcome. Early, early days. Is there some issue with the commissioner versus provision split then within that? Yeah, I think it's all about Because local authorities kind of went back to being providers as well, didn't they? So if you're They've come out of being providers because it's all contracted out. They no longer provide any services, they simply pay for services. Uh, what about health visiting and school nursing, so the Notch 19 services? I know Barnes, the local authority, they do pay their Notch 19 service. They might, that Barnsley might be different. In Sheffield, that belongs to the Children's Hospital. Okay, I know Barnsley local authority. So the Barnsley local authority yeah. have got that. So again, it's different everywhere. Yeah. But again, they, they've got that sort of under contract with the NHS, because obviously they've got public health and the local authorities as well. The whole point is now, in fact, I was listening to a very interesting conversation this morning between Rotherham CCG and Rotherham Acute Trust. They now talk as one person. So that whole commissioning thing will start to change significantly. Contracting will change significantly. Yeah. Everything is going to change. Conflict of interest, that's all, you know, in terms of, but yeah. Now, if we were, if we were, um, abiding by the Health and Social Care Act by the letter, you're absolutely right. But everybody's pretending that doesn't exist anymore and moving into the new world. And the only reason that we can't get any statutory time for this is because Parliament's rather obsessed with Brexit at the moment. So That's it, the point, isn't it? It will yeah. hopefully become statutory. And people will just work through it. And they already are. Interestingly, there's a whole sense now that NHS England and NHSI just sort of say, look, if you can get on with it, just, just do it. Yes. Mentioned about workforce structure and mm. changing, particularly obviously mentioned Basel Law. Mm. Uh, I've worked across Doncaster and Basel Law, mm. and I know there's a big drive, and also I'm working with Rotherham now, so there's a big drive across all the trusts, particularly for midwifery, to rotate the workforce into every area right. on a regular basis. Mm. So is that what, where it's stemming from? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it will be very much what every one of those has got a work stream with a programme director. I think the thing to be that's very encouraging about this. This isn't about being done to. This isn't a takeover. This isn't somebody else making the decision. This is the organisations and the clinicians coming together to say, what's going to work best for us? So inevitably, they will be changing that. There's no point in doing it if we don't change things. So yes, they'll be changing this. But I think the thing that is different about this, this is the people who are actually delivering those services, who are also making the decisions about how we need to be delivered differently. Who so sits, watch this space. Who sits within that then? So who represents rather than that sort of local authority as well as someone from health? Everybody's there. Every city local is authorities are there, CCGs are there, all the providers, voluntary sector are there, everybody's there. Mm. Some partners are playing a more active part than others. Mm. So it was quite noticeable this morning, there's very few local authority people there this morning, but you know, they're, they're, they're there. And of course the final thing to feature into this, which is Generation Z. Um, and we cannot get away from this because it's really important. I'll come on to talk a little bit more about Generation Z, but, but, but add into this a very different generation who are looking for very, very different things from their career, from their lives, and generally, um, and it's Generation Z. We desperately need to attract into our workforce in order to keep the whole show on the road. It, everything leads to the fact they're gonna want a different offer, and I'll come on to talk a bit more about that in a moment. So, how, how's everybody responding to this? Well, we've suddenly got a flurry of new roles that we didn't have even 18 months ago. So who are these new kids on the block then? Well, uh, the first is the nursing associates, we've got physicians associates, advanced practitioners, and then we've got, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about these three in a moment, but we've also got, uh, just to give you an idea about where we're seeing quite a lot of innovation, We've now got some people called doctor's assistants coming along, and I actually saw a project that was doing this, that again was down in the, uh, down in the south somewhere. Um, and essentially, every doctor was allocated a band three doctor's assistant, and the productivity, and this was, this was actually in somewhere that, where, where their doctor workforce was really, really stretched. And to have one band three working exclusively with them, basically running around doing all the jobs, 
it freed up masses amount of their time. It actually just shows you, for a lot of us as healthcare professionals, how much work we do that probably somebody else should be doing. And they weren't just doing clinical roles, they were doing a lot of the forms, they were doing you know, a lot of the sort of liaison and stuff. Really, really successful. And actually, it, it, it pretty well is all, you know, gloves are off now. Everybody is now moving into different spaces. Paramedics, they're everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. GP surgeries, emergency care rooms, community practices, all the rest of it. In fact, the one place we haven't got paramedic, paramedics anymore is out is out <laughs> um, Because, obviously, and I completely get this, you know, that actually I suspect that there is a lifespan to doing that job before you sort of think, you know, I just do not want to be out in the freezing cold at 2 o'clock in the morning, but yet another road traffic, you know, calamity. Um, when actually you can use your skills in a way that's more compatible with your mental health, family life, the whole thing. And that's the same for lots of professions. And the other thing that we've absolutely got to nail on this is we always worked. You know, when I trained as a nurse, the expectation was is that you do nursing for the rest of your life. And lots of nurses do. But equally, we've got a different generation and the work has changed and we've got to prepare our workforce for the fact we skill them and then we need to make sure that we can apply those skills elsewhere. Yes. Sorry, I'm just very interested because I teach into the position associate program and I'm kind of keeping my eye on what's happening with the nursing associates. There's work ongoing, I know, with those roles in terms of getting them on a registering body. Mm -hmm. Is that the case for some of these other things that come down towards the bottom no. of the... So these are just... Yeah. The, the doctor's assistants and hybrid generic support roles, these are all balanced, you know, two, three, sometimes four and all the rest of it. They don't need to be regulated. They need to have employer liability. They need to have good supervision arrangements. Most of them are now being done as apprenticeships because of the levy. They do not need regulating. We can, you know, we actually need to stay as far away from regulation as we can because actually the big complaints about regulation is it's actually getting in the way of developing the workforce that we actually need. The hybrid generic support roles you're seeing a lot more of in community settings. So really very good stuff there where, for example, you know, particularly for people who have got long-term chronic conditions, you know, they do not want a respiratory nurse specialist followed by a physio, followed by a community pharmacist, followed this line of people knocking at their door when actually lots of the evidence says a band three, a band four, who is working to a protocol, properly trained and working to a protocol and supervision can actually go in and actually deliver a lot of that care in one go uh, very successfully. They build up good relationships with the clients. And again, lots and lots. I mean, the press is stuffed full of all of these innovations happening all over the place now. And very often it's simply, some of it's being driven by workforce need, but some of it's also the fact people need different things now. They don't necessarily need a registered professional coming in, giving their top and take me work, going off again, handing over to another one. So, you know, you need to use your experts for their expertise, not for a lot of the day-to-day -day care. Next one, please. I'll see those cats, but I can't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> I just say, when I think about Canada, we've got um, CCAC, which is a uh, community-based, so what you would be as a nurse, or, you know, you'd be managing those so teams. In which yeah. case, you would be sort of, there would be something else doing the front, front lines, yeah. stuff, but you'd just be managing the care that they receive. And we're getting a lot more of that as well. We're seeing a lot more of care managers doing exactly that. Other people are delivering that. So that's, we, we, we are starting to see quite a lot of innovation. There's been some fantastic work that's gone on in Sheffield, actually, where the community nursing assistants have been able to administer, oh, it's, it's uh, managing diabetes, they've been able to administer, you know about this, uh, under protocol, huge difference to work yeah, home. That's it, yeah. yeah. And, it, and, you know, patients have to be very stable, there has to be a whole protocol and all the rest of it. Really, so, so actually for a lot of this, it's, it's about having the imagination to think about from the patient's point of view, how could this be better? Mm -hmm. Not always about the fact that well, I'm a registered professional and I do this and let's hand on to that and all the rest of it, which actually we've still got, still got a lot of that going on. So nursing associates, now this is an HEE 